deceleration, resulting in forces on a man's body equal to many times his own weight. Special devices were built to teach the astronauts the exacting skill of spacecraft attitude control in the conventional attitudes and the unconventional, as might be experienced in a tumbling spacecraft. The astronauts' activities were not confined to training alone. Working closely with design engineers, they made significant contributions to the development of the various systems. For example, the environmental control system and its pressure-tight suit, which cools the astronaut and provides him with breathing oxygen. In the event of spacecraft cabin pressure loss, the suit functions as an independent pressure envelope. Spacecraft interior layout and the positioning of controls and switches also benefited by the astronaut's contributions. Each regarded the Mercury spacecraft with a high degree of personal interest. One aspect of the spacecraft was uniquely personal, the astronaut's support couch. Each of the seven had his own, molded especially for his body. The design of the contour couch was a feature exclusively developed by NASA for Project Mercury. Its shape enabled a man to withstand up to 20 Gs. Its construction of crushable honeycomb aluminum bonded to a fiberglass shell and lined with foam rubber had been well proved by a series of impact tests. A production Mercury spacecraft was ready for flight test with a Redstone launch vehicle some two years after program inception. This first launch attempt on November 21st, 1960 comprised a strange admixture of failure and success. Slow motion photography recorded the sequence of events which followed the start of MR-1's engine. As the redstone lifted from the pad, the two tail plugs supplying ground electrical power failed to pull loose in the correct sequence. A resulting undesired voltage potential was sensed by the vehicle's abort sensing system, which told the engine to shut down. The redstone then settled back onto the pad. Noting the shutdown, the spacecraft's electronic brain signaled for escape tower jettison. Sensing further that it was at a low altitude, the spacecraft then initiated deployment of its parachute landing system. Mercury Redstone No. 1, a flight test failure, a successful demonstration of its system's capabilities. Less than a month after the first attempt, the same spacecraft was launched by vehicle MR-1A into a suborbital ballistic flight. All events occurred as programmed. The spacecraft attained a velocity of 4,909 miles per hour, was weightless for five minutes, and sustained deceleration of 11 Gs on re-entry. Recovery of the spacecraft after a total flight time of 15 minutes and 45 seconds was accomplished smoothly. On the morning of May 5, 1961, the primary goal of Project Mercury came sharply into focus. Three successful unmanned flights had proved that the Redstone launch vehicle and spacecraft were ready for manned application. Today, the ballistic mission would be flown once again, but this one, Mercury Redstone No. 3, would be different. For Navy Commander Alan B. Shepard, the countdown had begun months earlier. From the day he was selected to be the first American to attempt suborbital spaceflight, he had undergone 40 separate simulated flights. Three days ago, he had stood as he stood now when the flight was scrubbed for weather. But today, May 5th, the weather was go. The launch vehicle and the spacecraft named Freedom 7 were go. The launch pad crews and downrange recovery forces were go. As the launch and flight of Freedom 7 were monitored by Mercury Control, it became apparent that all systems were functioning perfectly. At five minutes and 14 seconds after launch, at a peak altitude of 116 statute miles, the retro rockets fired, and astronaut Shepard in Mercury spacecraft Freedom 7 began his long plunge back to Earth. Astronaut Alan Shepard, the first American to achieve spaceflight, was successfully recovered from Mercury spacecraft Freedom 7. His recovery, and also that of the spacecraft, completed all the mission objectives of Mercury Redstone No. 3. The next step in the program was to confirm the mission's success. Two and a half months later, a Mercury spacecraft was once again prepared for flight. This one was slightly different, having an observation window for attitude reference and recognition of ground checkpoints. 
Another new feature was the explosive operated exit hatch. The astronaut selected for the Mercury Redstone No. 4 mission, Air Force Captain Virgil Grissom, entered the spacecraft at 3.58 a.m. on the morning of July 21, 1961. Three hours and 22 minutes later, MR-4 was launched. Primary flight objectives were as before. Familiarize man with a brief but complete space flight experience, including the liftoff, powered, weightless, and landing phases of the flight. In addition, effectiveness of the spacecraft window was to be determined, and the explosively actuated hatch was to be flown for the first time in a manned spacecraft. Shortly after Liberty Bell 7 reached the water, the hatch blew prematurely. Astronaut Grissom escaped unhurt from the sinking spacecraft. However, the extra weight of water proved too much for the recovery helicopter to lift, and Liberty Bell 7 was lost. Despite this loss, the flight of MR-4 was a success, having achieved all of its primary objectives. Two manned suborbital missions had been accomplished. Project Mercury was now ready for the big one. The Mercury Atlas space vehicle, which was to put the first American into Earth orbit, had already undergone five unmanned flight tests, of which two had failed. Three months ago, the fifth flight test, with a chimpanzee in the spacecraft, had successfully achieved two orbits of the Earth. The launch operation for Mercury Atlas No. 6, which began in the pre-dawn of February 20, 1962, was the largest and most significant to date in the Mercury program. At the launch complex, 2,600 people were engaged in pre-launch preparation. 16 tracking stations, forming a worldwide network, were manned by a further 1,100 people who were also making last-minute preparations. Spaced along the planned orbital paths were recovery forces, a task force of ships and planes in which some 15,000 personnel waited to play their part. And Marine Lieutenant Colonel John Glenn prepared for his role in this, the first orbital manned space mission, the primary objective of Project Mercury. For astronaut Glenn and the Mercury team, the test objectives for the MA6 mission of Friendship 7 were simple and clearly defined. To evaluate the performance of a manned spacecraft system in a three-orbit mission, and evaluate the effects of spaceflight on the astronaut. For those who watched and waited, an even more basic objective was recognized. Our nation was about to meet the challenge of manned spaceflight. Atlas with spacecraft Friendship 7 rose slowly at first, then much more rapidly as it gained speed with altitude. After two minutes, booster engine cutoff occurred as programmed, and the booster section was jettisoned. The escape tower, now unneeded, was also jettisoned. Five minutes after launch, the space vehicle at an altitude of 100 miles, SECO, sustainer engine cutoff. The spacecraft was released from the launch vehicle and the posigrade rockets fired. As Friendship 7 was inserted into orbit, astronaut Glenn and his spacecraft became weightless. As the spacecraft orbited the Earth, it was passing from one tracking station to another. At a speed of 17,500 miles per hour, it takes only 88 minutes to circle the globe. Across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa, and then over the Indian Ocean into the night of Australia. Streaking into the sunrise, Friendship 7 passed over Hawaii and the Pacific Ocean, back toward its launch point in the United States. At the end of the first orbit, a thruster malfunction permitted only partial use of the automatic stabilization and control system. Astronaut Glenn took over and controlled the spacecraft manually. The second orbit over Mouché, Australia, a ground telemetry signal indicated that the heat shield might be loose. A decision was made by...